Good evening. Stacy Noisy, Director of Curriculum, and Dr. Susan Coleman, Assistant Superintendent for Student Services, are going to help me paint the picture of who the students are in our district that we serve. So I know that you probably all know us by the buildings, the eight facilities that we have that house the students and faculty in the district. But today we'd like to share with you more about who those people are who make up our district, the students and adults who come to learn in these buildings every day. So as many of you know, as reflected on our website and in all of our newsletters, the district in 2009 developed a mission statement um, that we are deeply committed to. We invited all faculty, um, buildings and grounds staff, paraprofessionals, transportation um, drivers to help us identify what it would look like if a student achieved our mission statement. And as a result of that work, then the district began working on its curriculum and its assessments to develop a way for us to ha actually have students achieve those mission, state, um, mission traits. And so today, at the end of the presentation, we are hopeful that you will be able to recognize the measures District 95 uses to currently evaluate our level of performance and then to examine the attributes of District 95 staff. So one of the ways that we begin to look at the district is based on our student enrollment. And as many of you are aware, the district has had a declining enrollment over the past few years. In 2016, however, our enrollment remained constant. And we know that on the north side of the district, we have some new subdivisions being developed, and that could bring additional students to the district. In addition to the number of students we serve at each level, we also look at um, the attributes of those students and um, and how they um, help us serve them. So Stacy is going to talk to you a little bit about the diversity within our community. Thank you, Jody. So as we take a look at the demographics across the district over the past several years, we've remained fairly constant with the types of students and families who live here. Based on the 19, I'm sorry, the 2015 demographic survey that was reported on the report card for the state of Illinois, 80% of our students identified as white or Caucasian. The increases that we have seen have been in the Asian population and the Hispanic population, but those have both been less than 2% change. Where we really see a change in demographics has to do with our diversity, and that's more about the diversity and the languages that are represented by the students for Lake Zurich. Last year, as we compiled the data, 15% of students across the district identified on their home language survey that they spoke two or more languages in their homes. This year, when we compiled the data, 20% of students identified as speaking another language in their home. For all students who identify that they speak another language in their home, the state requires us to do a screening to identify who has limited English proficiency or who qualifies for support for English learner services. Across the district, we have about 300 students who qualify for EL services, and that is um, an option for students, so they can waive, the families can waive that if they choose, but about 90% of our students choose to accept the services if they qualify. The most predominant languages here in Lake Zurich, in addition to English, is Spanish, Polish, and Russian, and we've seen a growing number of families who also speak Korean, Hindi, and Serbian over the last few years. This chart represents the number of students in District 95 who have qualified as limited English proficient from 2008 to 2016. The blue bars and the gold bar represent the same identified students, whereas the gold bar are all those students who qualified and the blue bars then represent the students who accepted services. Dr. Susan Coleman is going to share with you some information about our special education programs and students. Thank you. District 95 proudly serves over 700 students who have special needs and require an IEP, a special education and related services. 
Under IDEA, which is the Illinois Disabilities Education Act, we as a district are required to provide services in all 14 categories that are eligible special education categories. As you can see, um, there are, we, have, we serve a variety of students with a very, very diverse and unique learning needs. Currently, we service 14 out of the, thir rather 13 out of the 14 special education categories. The only category we do not have an eligible student right now is the deaf and blindness. Overall, special education students represent 13% of our total student population. And the services and um, supports required for these students require very specialized instructors who have expertise in a variety of learning strategies and instructional strategies to support the students with the varied needs that you see up here. And now I'm going to give this back to Jody. So we would like to share with you some of the measures that you're probably very familiar with that districts use to evaluate their impact on student achievement. Lake Zurich High School is recognized as a high-performing school. In fact, the um, US News and World Report, Newsweek, The Washington Post, The Daily Beast, and the College Board have recognized it as an outstanding high school. We'd also like to share some of the other traditional measures of success that many districts use to evaluate their impact on student learning. One of those pieces of data is around attendance. As you can see, we live in a community where parents and students value education. 96% of our students attend school on a regular basis. Our data over time indicates that 97% of Lake Zurich students graduate within four years. This slide illustrates that our graduation rates are consistent with our comparable districts. We talk about benchmark districts or comparable districts, and so we um, compare ourselves to other unit school districts uh, in terms of our finances and our student achievement. And Julia will reference some of those districts too in, the, in later slides. So of those graduating students, a high percentage attend two or four year colleges. Last year, 92% of Lake Zurich students self-reported that they would be attending a two or four year university. The state uses a formula based on ACT or SAT scores and grade point average to annually determine the top 10% of all high school graduates in the state. These students are designated as Illinois State Scholars. This graph identifies the number of high school graduates each year, and of those graduates, the number of students who are then designated as Illinois State Scholars. Despite Lake Zurich High School's declining enrollment, you can see that we have had an increase in the number of students who receive this distinction. Districts also use student achievement data in order to look at its, its strengths and its opportunities for improvement. And Stacy is going to share with you some of our K-8 student achievement data. So if you have a student in grades two through eight in District 95, we use the MAP assessment as one of our standardized measures to help us look at student learning across the grade levels. We, this, the MAP is also known as the Measures of Academic Progress, and it is a subs subscription-based computer adaptive assessment. So as students take the assessment for both reading and math, as they answer one question, depending on whether they got it right or wrong, it adapts to their needs so that we can get an accurate measure of their learning. This graph represents our reading scores. So we've taken all of our student scores and we've averaged them. It shows the mean here. On average, because this is a nationally normed test, 50% of students who are taking the test would perform lower and 50% of students would perform higher. So as we take a look at our students' means, you can see that most of our students score between the 60th and 70th percentile, which means they're outperforming the, dis the national average. This represents our 
math scores. The previous one was reading. And you can see we see, have very similar scores for those students in grades two through eight. We also use the MAP assessment for our students in high school who have special needs or in EL programs or those who are taking the reading strategies class. The next two graphs that we're going to look at is a look at the growth measures. So with MAP, they identify a growth percentage that students should increase each year. And because it also is nationally normed, we would expect that 50% of our students would meet their growth targets. And as you can see here for our reading scores, just over 50%, between 50 and 60% on average, meet their growth targets. And we see a similar representation for math. One thing that MAP allows us to do is it allows us to look at our students and compare their scores to each other. So we can take a look at our subscores or subgroups so that we're looking at students who perhaps fall into some of these uh, different categories, such as the students who are on free and reduced lunch or have a low SES, socioeconomic status, or those students who are in special education and see how they're, com how they're performing compared to the norm. We can also take a look at our limited English proficient students and see how they're performing compared to their English speaking peers. And as you can see in each of those subgroups, we do see an achievement gap and that's something that we need to work toward. We can also take a look at MAP scores based on ethnicity. One of the challenges of looking at ethnicity though is that the group sizes are not necessarily comparable. The size itself is not. But we can tell by looking at this that we do have some work to do with our students who fall in different ethnic groups. We see similar results for our reading scores when we look at each of those subgroups. And Jody's going to talk about the standardized test for our six through 12 students. So the ACT is a academic achievement assessment that many of you are familiar with. It's used for college admission. Students who graduated in 2016 had an average score of 24.3. This compares to a national average of 20.8. Illinois is one of only a few states until 2016 who required all high school juniors to take the assessment. This is important to point out because nationally, only those students who plan on applying to college take the assessment. This slide illustrates that consistently Lake Zurich High School students perform at a higher achievement level than their peers. This slide illustrates that in each content area, English, mathematics, reading, and science, Lake Zurich student, students still score significantly higher than their peers. Instead of using the average of our comparable districts, this slide shows how Lake Zurich students compare to specific benchmark districts. And as you can see, we are comparable to all of those districts with whom we compare ourselves to, where our students are performing at a high level. This slide, like Stacy referenced with the MAP data, allows us to look at subgroup performance levels. One of the difficulties, as referenced, is that when you look at a subgroup, the number of students in that subgroup may be small. For instance, in one of our subgroups, the number in that group is two. Because the state no longer includes Hispanic as an ethnic category, our Hispanic students may self-report as American Indian or white. However, even with the limitation of the way of this reporting, we recognize that there is an achievement gap, especially within the black and African American and American Indian categories. We know that we also have an achievement gap within our special education population compared to their peers. This slide also allows us to look at those students who are identified as low socioeconomic or receive free and reduced lunch. And we recognize that there is a performance gap in that population as well. And last year, in terms of gender achievement, we recognized a slight difference, but that was only a one-year data point, and so we would need to continue to look at data to see if that was consistent in continuing years. 
The Advanced Placement Program created by the College Board offers college-level curricula and examinations to high school students. American colleges and universities may grant placement and course credit to students who obtain high scores on these examinations. The AP curriculum for each of the various content areas is created by the College Board through a panel of experts and college-level educators in that field of study. For a high school course to have the AP designation, the course must be audited and approved by the college board. High school students, um, high schools offer students the opportunity to participate in these courses because the research has shown that a student's strength of transcript, the rigor and challenge of the courses taken throughout high school is a better predictor of college completion than a test score. This slide illustrates that Lake Zurich is increasing the student population in the AP program. Last year, the high school had 569 9th through 12th graders participate in an AP course. Approximately 25% of our high school students are currently participating. We believe we have more students who could succeed in these AP courses. This slide allows us to look at the number of students who are taking courses within a specific discipline. Lake Zurich High School offers two AP art classes, two AP English classes, seven AP social studies classes, three AP world language classes, five AP math classes, one AP music class, and four AP science classes. 86.6% of students who took an AP test in 2016 scored a three or above on at least one exam. A three, four, or five are the scores that a college or a university will look at to determine whether a student can place out of that, that course at a university. So while we believe that more students could and should participate in the AP program, this slide looks at how we have grown the number of students who have accepted that um, the invitation to participate in that challenging program. Report cards are another traditional way we measure student success. In K through in kindergarten through third grade, we describe student performance with AC area of concern, LS learning the skill, and MS mastered the skill. And in fourth through twelfth grades, we give the typical letter grade. The report card is an instrument that everyone is familiar with. However, internally, a variety of groups are questioning the value of that report card grade. Traditionally, the report card grade is an average of major exams, compositions, quizzes, projects, homework, work habits, class participation, etc. When we merge these diverse sources of evidence on student performance, it distorts the meaning of the grade. One of the questions we are considering internally is, is there a better way to communicate the degree to which students have mastered the content and skills in a discipline than this averaging of all of those grades? Now that we've talked about the students and their success within our district, Julia Besich, the Director of Human Resources, would like to share some information about our staff. Thank you, Jody. Now that we have a profile of the students that District 95 serves, we have to ask the question, how do we meet their multiple needs in order to ensure academic growth? The answer is with the expertise of a highly functional staff. District 95 employs just under 800 employees and is one of the largest, if not the largest employer in Lake Zurich. In order to meet the needs of our students and offer a variety of programs, we employ 483 certified staff members, which equal 471.6 FTE. 
In addition to the certified staff listed above, the district also employs administrative staff and support staff members, such as paraprofessionals, office staff, bus drivers, and others. As you can see from the certified staffing breakdown by level, District 95 employs various types of educational specialists to meet the needs of students and staff members. Teaching is a complex and ever-changing profession. As we try to instill the love of learning into our students, we feel the same about our staff members. Just like we would expect our doctors, lawyers, and other professionals to keep current in their practice, the same is true of teaching. 86% of certified staff in District 95 have a master's degree, with 39% of those staff members holding a master's degree and 60 credit hours past those degrees. District 95 also values experience and longevity in our staff members. Currently, over 60% of district certified staff have 10 or more years experience in the district. In addition to professional experience, District 95 believes in building a common understanding and vocabulary among teachers. The district has partnered with Research for Better Teaching to provide a unique professional development opportunity for our staff by offering the Studying Skillful Teaching course. To date, just under 60% of our staff have completed the course and currently we have several more enrolled. The Illinois State Board of Education calculates the three-year average percentage of teachers returning to work at the same district. While having some turnover is normal, retention and stability are important in teaching staff to foster a collaborative environment in which teachers work together to advance student achievement. Another metric we use to evaluate the district is to compare various data points. The district historically has used a list of comparable school districts that Jody mentioned earlier, which are similar sized unit districts in contract negotiations, financial comparisons, and student achievement comparisons. This summary outlines how District 95 compares an average teacher salaries with our comparable districts as reported on the Illinois State Board of Education school report card. Just as other professionals are evaluated on a set of standards, educators also have professional standards and expectations that evaluate whether our practices are bringing out the best learning in our students. We have to know our impact. Part of growing our staff hinges on an effective evaluation process that includes an outside observer, self-reflection, and data. The district's evaluation process includes all three of these components. A growth mindset is not only important for our students, but it is also critical for our staff. We want our evaluation process to continu continually grow our staff into better professionals so that they can continue to support our students. This slide in shows the past four years of teacher evaluation rating data. Another way we measure success is through the implementation of impactful instructional practices that we have focused on during professional development. Two years ago, we began to use a process called learning walks to gather data on instructional practices and students' ability to articulate what they are learning, how they are learning, and why they are learning. This slide simply illustrates one piece of the learning walk protocol that we provide to schools. The Lake Zurich administrative team consists of 42 administrators. There are eight principals, 10 assistant principals, eight high school department chairs, two high school deans, nine directors, and three assistant superintendents. Of course, the superintendent as well. Similar to our certified staff, the district values continuing education and experience in our administrative staff. As a partner to the Studying Skillful Teaching course, building administrators have either completed or will be completing a partner course titled Analyzing Teaching for Student Results. The focus of the course is to shift leaders towards learning-focused supervision and evaluation by helping administrators zero in on high-leverage teaching strategies that make a difference to student learning. 
This course continues to build a common vocabulary and language and expectations among administrators and staff members. A similar comparison is made reviewing our administrative staff and average salaries compared to our comparable school districts. Similar to certified staff, building leaders are evaluated using a combination of factors including professional practice, attainment of goals, and student growth. Value is placed on continual improvement for both staff and administrative staff. Again, sir, similar to our teaching staff, the focus on growth and continual improvement carries over to our expectations for our administrative staff. In addition to our certified and administrative staff, the district employs many other educational support personnel. These employees cover a variety of services from the district for pay from payroll processing and bookkeeping to paraprofessionals in the classroom, technology, bus drivers, and many others. As in any large organization, having these various staff members are critical to the ongoing success of the district. And again, as mentioned earlier, no single measure accurately illustrates an organization's success, nor should be used to con guide continued improvement. It takes multiple measures and a collective group of individuals to ensure the success of our students. So this last presentation, which uh, falls on me, is the least visually pleasing of the presentations. Um, and it's about what we call beyond the classroom. And I put beyond in quotes because so much of it connects directly to the classroom. And I included this quote here um, just to emphasize, you know, active engagement with the kind of learning that takes place outside the traditional classroom does lead to happier, healthier, more um, goal-oriented and also just engaged students. And so the objective for this presentation is to simply convey the number, variety, and reach of student learning experiences in the district outside the traditional classroom. I've kind of organized these in three basic ways. Um, extra and essential on the left, then I talk about a newer, you know, emerging aspect of learning beyond the classroom that has to do with technology, and then some other and important areas I want to just touch on at the end. So what I call extra and essential, because they often might be what we call extracurriculars or out extra opportunities, but they are essential. I truly believe they are. And you can see here what happens at the elementary level in terms of every child being able to take art beginning in grade one, and then orchestra as an option for students begins in grade four, and band in grade five. And then after school clubs and activities, there typically are five to 12 per elementary school in the district, and they can fluctuate from year to year depending on what's of interest and what students subscribe to. Um, and you can see the examples of those opportunities here. And then at the bottom, I did want to point out that um, we have other opportunities for our kids to learn that intersect with our schools on a regular basis. The Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, we have programs at the Y, Quentin Road, and there are many others. And I think it's important to note that because they're part of our community and where our kids learn, I'm always interested in making sure we're in touch with other people who help our kids learn to find out what are they learning about about how our kids learn. I think we shouldn't lose sight of that. This uh, just outlines at the middle school what those opportunities look like. You can see that they increase in number of opportunities and really sixth and seventh grade is about going through rotations of opportunities to learn about what's possible and then narrowing it down largely in eighth grade um, or in some cases seventh grade. And then after school clubs and activities, there are 15 to 20 per school in any given year. And you can see some examples right here of what's been in the offering in the last few years. And athletics gets a separate slide at the middle school because by this time we offer 10 to 12 traditionally competitive sports. You can see examples there of what's offered. And then we also offer intramural or non-traditional or non-competitive athletic opportunities. Sometimes they can be both depending on the year um, and depending on what tack they take. 
And then I wanted to mention community service opportunities. We only have one formal community service club at one of our schools, but there are classes that incorporate community service into their curriculum, not as a formal required part, but often because they make good sense to do so with what's being learned in the curriculum. So students will then often go out and do something in the community that ties to what they're doing in a particular curriculum. Moving on to the high school, I actually start the, pre this, the presentation on the high school with this because a lot of folks don't actually know what the requirements are. And this is sort of the, the, um, the lines around within which everything else takes place to a certain degree because if these aren't achieved, students don't graduate. So I often like to just remind people that these are the requirements. Our kids, as you saw from the graduation rates, hit these requirements at a high rate and really most of our kids exceed these requirements and take much more and that's what we're gonna talk about. I'll note that um, there are elective courses in what are traditionally called the core subject areas, so English, math, science, social studies offer electives of course, but I'm gonna focus on here just the electives that are outside of those core, those core subject area departments and note that in the departments listed here are applied technology, business, drama, family and consumer sciences, music, world languages, and the courses we offer at the Lake County Technology Campus, that there can be anywhere from 15 to 20 elective opportunities for kids in those departments. And I call them sequenced courses because they might be elective, but I might have to take a prerequisite to get to one. It's kind of laddered, right? More sophisticated courses. And then for after school clubs and activities, we have approximately 40. Some are competitive, most are not. And then high school athletics. Currently we have 24 sports offered this year, each typically offered for boys and girls um, and at multiple levels, freshman, sophomore, junior year. We'll have different number of teams per, per some years. And then gymnastics and swimming are what we call individual postseason only, meaning we don't have a formal team for this sport, either because of historically lower rates in subscription and or we don't have the facilities for it. But kids who compete on these in clubs outside of school can at the end of the year during the state competition compete in the state competition as a Lake Zurich competitor. And then community service opportunities, again, I think are a very important part of how students learn outside the traditional classroom. And you can see here, if a student has been inducted into the National Honor Society, they're expected to complete 35 hours of community service. And if they're in the Interact Club, which is uh, part of really sponsored by Rotary, uh, 20 to 50 hours of community service. And then the next two are actual service clubs themselves, which are like after school clubs, but their whole purpose is community service. And we have kids who very much want to get engaged that way. And so there's no minimum for those. It's just the only focus of the club is service. Finally, our athletic teams often will engage in community service as part of being on the team but that is not mandatory. This next slide um, is about internships and worksite learning. Now currently we have no formal internships in place for our students with businesses in the area, um, but what I call worksite learning can either be a matter of students going to work sites in the community and learning about what takes place there, or employers coming into the school to engage with students about the opportunities that occur at their work sites or in the terms of what a career in that field would look like. So, you know, the most common example is our consumer education class every year has mock interviews where business people will come in and conduct interviews of our students, just like it were a real employment interview. And uh, we had 150 students about this year. In the last year or so, we've had lunch and learns with, 12, with business reps coming in to talk to students about careers in their field. We actually had a job fair, which was for summer employment. And then we've had job shadowing before. So the next part I want to talk about for a few minutes is called blended and virtual learning. And it's really a phenomenon that's coming out of our increased use of technology. And what I talk about today is really going to be about a spectrum. 
There's no hard and fast definition that defines blended learning or virtual learning. They exist on a continuum of learning that can change at, uh, even in the course of a single course a student might take. And often we look at how technology is intersecting with learning based on this framework here, which is called the SAMR framework, where the lowest level is um, when technology just substitutes for what we used to do with paper. So instead of handing it in on paper, you hand it in electronically and there's no paper. Um, that would be the, the simplest example, where you do a task on the computer that you used to write down, and now the technology facilitates the management of that task being done and things like that. That's the simplest example of substitution. But as we go up and as our teachers become more and more sophisticated with how they use technology, they can actually design learning tasks using technology that you couldn't do if you didn't have that technology. They change the nature of the way the child might learn, um, and they change the way um, the teacher might assess. They change the interaction between the student and the teacher over time. So blended itself is really a matter of when I'm blending a student doing certain things digitally and online with teaching them face to face. And that enables a few things. Um, first of all, by moving in and out of these opportunities, I might change how they consume content, right? All of our sixth through 12th graders have iPads. I don't, I don't necessarily have to have them take home a book anymore. If I have it available on the iPad, they can now consume it on the iPad. Um, but if it's appropriate, I might have them do it in paper. The point is now that I can move back and forth depending on what I think is appropriate. To produce work for assessment and feedback virtually, a good example is I might have them do a quiz on a reading that they did before they come into class. Because it's electronic, I can get all the data results before they even come into class, and I can change my lesson based on those. If I didn't have that and I had to have them do the quiz on paper, and come in, that's a different way I have to teach. So that's a way that blended learning enables different things. The most common one is collaboration. Our students have Google accounts, and on those they can collaborate with each other from wherever they are, whenever they are, hopefully not when they're supposed to be doing something else, but they can engage and collaborate, and what they collaborate and create is now held out in the cloud for them to access any given time. So you can see here some of the tools that are commonly being used by our teachers and our kids. Canvas is the most common one because it's our learning management system where courses are actually housed for students to access. And then Google, YouTube, and many others that I'm not listing here can facilitate this kind of learning. We do have a course right now that's really a, a blended course. It's designed to be blended. Consumer Ed is the example where they might not necessarily come to class every day but they'll only come certain days, and then they will conduct class virtually or do work online other days. And that obviously creates opportunities for students with scheduling, with workload, and with other things that they might face uh, if they didn't have it. An, ex uh, an external blended option that's available is Ombudsman. This is something we contract with outside of the district for students who are behind in their credits. They don't have enough credits to graduate on time but they can go to Ombudsman where they can do certain content online, but they have a coach there, basically a teacher, who will then work with them face-to-face -to -face too. And because of the mixing, they can accelerate the rate at which they gain credits so they can graduate on time. This is an option we use for very few students, but it is there. And then virtual learning is just what it says. There's no blended option. You are on the computer in your entirety, basically. You are only working on a computer and doing a curriculum that is computer-based. Um, Illinois Virtual High School might be an example where they're using a different curriculum like AP, and you could do an AP course online, but you're never meeting face-to-face -face with a teacher. And again, very few of our students currently exercise these opportunities. And right now, they're often simply not the best opportunities to exercise for our students. And then personalized learning is something that's growing. And again, our teachers do this on a spectrum, and we do it here or there in pieces. Um, but Alex Math Program is one where we'll often have students identify gaps in their learning using this program. And then as a supplement to their learning with us, we will have them do units of study on Alex and then assess how they did on that, 
and then use that information in how we teach them. Um, and again, the idea with these programs is they provide regular feedback that the teacher can then um, personalize their learning as a result of it. So the last category I call other and important, and this is the only slide I have on this topic, but it's one I thought was important to put up here. Because when we talk about learning beyond the classroom, homework, and Claire's shaking her head, right? Because homework is one that we all face in one form or fashion with our students. Okay, I have a nine-year-old and a 13-year-old. I wish it were always a happy context that I faced with them with homework, but it's not. And I think we often struggle to understand how can we support our students in homework, how can we understand homework, and how can we assess the time it takes for our students to do it because that's learning beyond the classroom that they're doing, but we don't know how much it should take up compared to family time, dinner time, activities time, clubs, sports, things like that. So I put it up here because it does play a role in our students learning outside the classroom, and it's a substantial role. This is our current board policy on homework, and I actually think the policy itself is quite a good policy. It's clear and it defines some principles that are important, but it's something we'll have to continue to assess going forward, and that is, when we send a child to your home to say they need to complete this much homework, what are we asking to happen? And what are we communicating to you about how much time that should take and what should get done and what it should achieve? And then the, the next to the last one I'm gonna talk about is summer learning. Um, summer learning loss I talk about, it's, it's a topic that I've done quite a bit of research in, and the national research indicates that it's really the single biggest contributor to the achievement gap outside of things like parents' educational level. And I say contributor is not the right word because a parent's educational level isn't a contributor. It's a, char it's a characteristic of students who struggle on the wrong side of the gap. But summer learning loss is an actual contributor to the achievement gap. And the quickest way to say it is when a student leaves on average in May, their test score when they come back on the same test in September will be a month behind where it was when they left. And that's on standardized measures. Now that's an average. At-risk students, students who come from homes that where learning is harder to come by and harder to support sometimes, they fall even further behind. Math is a subject that's particularly hard hit. So it's important to recognize that all the work we're doing with students all year suddenly gets affected in the summer when that learning's not taking place. And we have to keep that in mind when we talk about what learning takes place outside the classroom or beyond the classroom. In District 95, this is just numbers from the last summer. Our K-8 learning was robust. We had over 700 registrations. I don't know the individual numbers, but we had a lot of kids at summer learning. Um, and we had courses that support kids who we identified as being behind. And we had courses that are typically called enrichment, kids who are not behind on important grade level standards, but they want to take and learn in an area that is not necessarily about those standards, but is what we typically call enrichment. Um, we also have students in uh, English language courses who, because in their language acquisition and development, we're able to identify what specifically they can work on and have a much more specific program for them in the summer, and that's very important. The other group that's not listed up here is what's called ESY, Extended School Year. Those are students with individual education plans and special education, and their plans specify that they should go and get summer learning to keep them from falling behind on certain specific skills related to their disability. And then we have courses at the high school level. I didn't have the number at the time I did this slide. It's approximately 390 students, I believe. Uh, 390 registrations for courses at the high school level. And we have courses that support kids in credit recovery. Short version is I didn't pass the class during the year. I have to get the credit. And then we have courses that support kids in advancing their work. In other words, they identified classes that they want to take next year. And in order to do it, they clear space out of their schedule by taking something in the summer that makes it easier to do that. So that's really the presentation. Um, 
of Beyond the Classroom. Again, not visually very exciting, um, a bit of a survey, but again, an important part to remember when we talk about what the district achieves for our kids.